We're in our ninth session today of what was meant to originally be a four-part series. It's safe to say that because of all of you, our extraordinary audience of business leaders and thought leaders throughout Africa and the world, you are a community that not only leads Africa in business, but you care deeply about the continent and the continent's future. And because of that, we are going to extend our series again, and we are currently planning sessions through the end of July, and we will keep you updated on that. First, I want to thank Standard Bank, our main sponsor, for their steadfast support of our work. Second, today I would like to thank Camille Olufwabwe. MyPad is the most important people of African descent under 40, an annual list of the most influential next-gen Black people in the world. Camille and I have something in common in that he also left the comfort of the corporate world to pursue his passion of bringing together members of the African diaspora in a media platform. He's been a wonderful collaborator for today's session, and we thank him very much for his effort to assemble today's fantastic panel. The third person I want to acknowledge as we go in today's session is Ebele Okobi. Ebele, our Nigerian sister, is with Facebook, and she oversees Facebook's public policy for Africa and the Middle East. In 2019, Ebele's brother, Chinedo, did something that all of us do sometimes. He jaywalked. He crossed the street, outside of the crosswalk. And he did this in California. The police saw him commit this transgression. They did not ask for his passport to know whether he was African American or Nigerian. They simply saw a black man. And before his engagement with the police was over, Chineda was dead within just minutes, just like George Floyd. Abele, as we discussed yesterday, today we say Chineda's name. We say it loudly. This brings me to our special guest today, Jide Zeitlin, Chairman and CEO of Tapestry Inc., the parent company of luxury brands Coach, Kate Spade, and Stuart Weitzman. When we decided with Camille to focus on today's sessions on what African business leaders need to know about social movements that have gained momentum in 2020, Camille sent me a link to Jide's interview on Good Morning America last week. He said, here's an example of a business leader who's taking up a leadership role with respect to Black Lives Matter. While I had not seen the video, I was not surprised. I've known Jide for over 20 years. He was ahead of me at Harvard Business School. He was ahead of me at Goldman Sachs. He's been a mentor of mine, yet together we have also mentored those behind us. He's been a supporter of the scholarship program I founded in South Africa, the Student Sponsorship Program. And together, we have supported scholarships through the Nigerian Higher Education Foundation together. I've seen Jide in a variety of professional contexts through the years, and he has always been a man of tremendous integrity and wisdom that normally comes only with age, but he had that wisdom long before he had gray hair. He's been a leader on the boards of important educational institutions, and he was chairman of the board at Amherst College when he arranged to give Nelson Mandela an honorary degree on what was Mandela's last visit to the United States. So when I saw that Jide, a Nigerian American, one of four black CEOs of a Fortune 500 company, was being recognized for his unequivocal voice on Black Lives Matter, I was not surprised. And I knew that I wanted him to speak with our audience of African business leaders. We have another special guest with us today. When I learned that Jide would be able to join us, my thoughts turned to another great African business leader in our midst. I've had the privilege of knowing both of these gentlemen since their earliest days in banking. Both of them, as black men, rose through the ranks to the highest levels of the most important banking institution in their respective markets, one in the US, the other in South Africa. Today, Jide runs a complex global company with a market cap of five billion. This other gentleman runs a complex global company with a market cap of 10 billion. Both of them lead through their astute business acumen, but both have clear moral compasses. Both are deeply dedicated to education as a path towards social justice, and both have huge hearts and are not afraid to take unpopular stands when it meets with their moral conviction. So here to welcome Jide today is the Group Chief Executive of Standard Bank, Sim Shabalala. Sim? Thank you ever so much, Teresa, and good afternoon from Johannesburg. I have the great honor and privilege of introducing our keynote speaker today, Mr. Jida Zetlin, Chairman and Chief Executive of the Tapestry Group and Chairman of the Nigerian Sovereign Investment Authority. Jida is a great American, a great African, 
a great international business leader and a fundamentally great human being. Some of his political consciousness and commitment was formed during his time in South Africa and apartheid, a very dark time. He is a shining example of what hope, courage, solidarity, and commitment to universal human rights can achieve. This morning, I saw a photograph of George Floyd's young daughter, her sad eyes just visible above her mask, and I was filled again with unspeakable sorrow. As Judah has said, and as Dr. Martin Luther King has said before him, it is intolerable that African Americans are still subject to such routine gratuitous brutality and are still stuck at the bottom of every social and economic ladder. It is 400 years since the first enslaved people were, were abducted from their homes in Africa and shipped to North America 244 years since the Declaration of Independence insisted that all people are created equal, and 56 years after the signing of the Civil Rights Act. And yet, here we are again. Here in Africa, we too have seen casual brutality by police and military against citizens they are meant to protect. Too often, we have seen the great founding documents of our states and our African Union apparently ignored. And we too have experienced what often feels like halting progress in the fight for justice, equality, and human development. We would be less than human if we did not sometimes feel the temptation to give way to despair, to surrender to cynicism, and to preach revenge and practice destruction. But if history teaches us anything, it teaches us that the path to despair leads only to more despair, that cynicism is barren, and that the choice to destroy leads only to more destruction. This is why thoughtful and hopeful voices like Jida's are so important, why his example is so crucial, and why we have so much to learn from the fact that he is an iconic figure, a Fortune 500 chief executive of African heritage. As Jida says, the only path forward is to reinforce the great founding documents, indeed such as the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the African Charter on Human and People's Rights. I have to quote it, I quote Article 4 thereof, which says, human beings are inviolable, Every human shall be entitled to respect for his life and the dignity of his person. We must take the documents at their word. Where they are not yet obeyed, we must will them into reality. We do so by insisting on our shared humanity and our equal dignity. We do so by active anti-racism. We do so by building and supporting strong, transparent, rule-bound institutions in government, business, and in civil society. We do so by identifying and uprooting the underlying causes of inequality in our countries and in the world. And we do so by creating paths to inclusion and opportunity for everyone. The road ahead is long, and there will be many more reverses and retreats along the way. We have many friends and many allies, of all races and backgrounds throughout the world. And our rights, while sometimes neglected, are more often secured by our country's laws and by solemn international covenants. None of what was true when Dr. King or Nelson Mandela or Ruth First or Kwame Nkrumah or Grasa Michelle were young. It would insult the memory of our great fathers and mothers not to use the immense resources at our disposal as corporate leaders to build the institutions that make rights real, to pursue equality of opportunity and above all, to keep creating hope. And in fact, there's much to be hopeful about. This is a dark month in a dark year probably the hardest of our lifetimes. But it is inarguable that we are far closer now in 2020 than we were a generation ago to extending the inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness 
not merely to members of favored nations or races or genders, but to all of humanity. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my great honor to invite Mr. Gita Zetlin to address us. Um, thank you for including me in this important conversation. Uh, I'm particularly grateful to you, Sim, for your such thoughtful words of introduction. So thank you very much. Uh, and, and you know, as I thought about this conversation, one of the questions that turned in my head was, um, you know, what does the discontent that's playing out on the streets of America have to do with Africa? You know, why, why is it relevant if one, has, you know, if, if one is, is sitting on the African continent um, and, and particularly as, as a business leader? Um, and and you know, I'd begin by saying um, that what's happening in America is systemic. Um, there's a lot of discussion in, in, in America around, well, it's just a few bad apples. Um, it's not really systemic, either in an American context or in a global context. Uh, and I'd argue otherwise, but you know, clearly, and as, as, Sim, as Sim mentioned in his, in his opening comments, uh, you know, this is not a new narrative. You know, this is, in an American context, a 400-year-old narrative. It's a longer narrative. Um, you know, in an African context, but it is one that began in Africa um, with, 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 you know, with the removal of, of Africans from the continent um, being taken to, to America. Um, and it's, and it's, it's one that you know, at its heart is based in economic exploitation. Uh, and until one really gets underneath um, the, the systemic um, processes and systems that have been put into place uh, in, in America, it's awfully hard um, to begin changing um, many of the of the outcomes. You know, the the the, the you, know, you talk about Chinedu and, and others. Um, you know, the, the types of outcomes, the types of events that we're seeing in America. Um, that said, uh, you know, if one thinks about, for example, um, the the um, what's happened with Africans in China um, through this throughout this pandemic. One realizes, okay. Um, it may be happening in a very viral and visible way in, in America, but it ultimately ends up having an impact in other places such as China because a, a lot of, a lot, and, and I'm not picking on China at all because it also, it also as, as I'll, I'll talk about in a moment, also um, has real ramifications on the African continent. But the, the, um, the, the thought process, the systemic, um, the systemic um, denigration of, Black people um, has been learned throughout the West, has been exported to Asia, um, and frankly is also very, very visible and very present um, on the continent. Uh, on the continent itself, um, Sim mentioned that uh, one of my roles is as, as chair of the Sovereign Wealth um, Fund in Nigeria, uh, and and it's always striking to me um, when when you know prior to the pandemic, I, I was spending a lot more time. Um, on the continent and in Nigeria in particular, but even now as we have as we have board calls via Zoom, um, I'm always struck by um, the degree of um, the same type of systemic issues that I see in, 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 in America. Um, in many ways, a different form of it taking place um, in a Nigerian context where, you know, whether it's, it's religion, whether it's, it's, it's different ethnic groups, so it, you know, a lot of it captured in the six geopolitical zones um, that you see many of the same types of dysfunctional, inefficient types of, of behavior taking place. You know, Nigeria would be um, so much more powerful um, if, if you know, many of the lines that were artificially drawn in terms of borders, many of the lessons taken um, were, were, were not present there. And, and as so many of you know, we could have that conversation um, across the continent in, in, in so many different countries. And so you know, for me, as I sat um, a little bit over a week ago, and I watched a lot of um, my peers and other corporations start making statements, um, I saw a lot of statements that to me um, felt relatively um, typical safe corporate. Um, you know, we, we, where they, they would say that they are, you know, that they, that they um, are, are, are unhappy with the events taking place, but wouldn't really talk at its core about what were the causes of the events taking place. And so I, I sat down on a Sunday morning and I began writing. 
Um, and I wrote a note you know, to our 25,000 um, or so employees around, around the globe. Uh, and I felt that uh, this was a moment um, as a corporate leader um, to be, um, to recognize our humanity, each of us as individuals, um, to be willing to be vulnerable to our people by sharing what I really thought, um, and, and to, to um, as such, uh, hopefully um, enable our people to feel comfortable um, speaking up and sharing their thoughts with their colleagues in so many more conversations than I could have. Um, and, and a lot of it came back to something um, and that I do think is also very relevant in an African context. But, you know, in, a, in an American context, we talk about diversity and inclusion, right? So diversity meaning kind of what's your, what's your mix of people of different ethnic backgrounds um, and, and across gender and other, other metrics, you know, sexual orientation, et cetera. Um, and, and inclusion being a real focus on what's the culture? Is there a culture that, that um, celebrates, that, that rewards people um, who come really as themselves to various conversations internally? Um, and, and my belief is that you know, um, ultimately, if America is going to get through um, this, not just this current period, but, but you know, this what has been, you know, as, as Sim touched on, a 400-year um, process, it's going to get through it not despite its diversity, but because of its diversity and because of the foundational impact that Black Americans and Americans of African descent um, have had on the country and will have on the country. And very much from the perspective of, you know, the more you have different perspectives, different voices um, in any conversation, um, the stronger the solutions, the stronger the insights are that you're going to bring from that. Uh, and then when I think about across the African continent, the amount of diversity that is Africa, the amount of, of strength and resources and insights that are represented across the continent. Uh, I, I, I believe that one of the great real untapped strengths um, of, of, of Africa and African businesses in particular is tapping into that diversity of perspectives, of insights, of experience. Uh, and that, that you know, particularly as one thinks about um, from a corporate perspective, the resources um, that, that African corporations um, marshal, you know, we, we, just, we just heard that, that, you know, that Standard has got a $10 billion market cap and clearly um, a, a substantial amount of capital. And, and if you, you reflect that across so many of the, of the companies that are, that are represented here on this, in, in this meeting, um, the, the impact that corporations can have as a force for good across the continent, both in terms of supporting um, your employees, um, supporting their ability to come to work, bringing their full selves to work, uh, and, and, and bringing their insights that will be different from the person to their left, to their right, um, to solving not just the problems of the corporation of how, how to grow your top line, how to grow your margins, your profitability, but ultimately realizing that corporations exist you know, within an ecosystem, within a community, a community of people, um, a community of, 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 of behaviors, and that to the extent that we as corporations can model um, certain, certain behaviors, uh, that we can act, again, as forces of good in our community, often in communities where, where um, there, you know, there are fewer good examples of that, um, even at a government level than one would hope. Uh, and so, you know, I, I do very much believe that the old fashioned, you know, where you said, you know, corporations only real, um, real, real uh, um, requirement or responsibility was to its stockholders is just that it's old fashioned, that, that to the extent that we um, look at ourselves as leaders in a broader community, literally the communities, the towns, the country that we, that we do business in, um, to our people, our employees more broadly, to our um, cons consumers, our customers, um, you know, as importantly as, as ever, um, the more we can have, uh, we, we, I think the more successful we'll ultimately be as businesses, but also the more we can really have a systemic impact and ultimately, to the extent that the environment we're in, the economy that we're, the countries that we're in, the economies that we're a part of are larger and growing, that's only going to benefit us as, as corporations. 
So um, we'll just, we'll just say uh, 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 thank you. Thank you for an opportunity to share a few words, a bit of perspective. Uh, but I, I would ask you not to look at your, at your television screens, at your smartphones, your iPads, um, and read what's going on in, in America as though it's something that's going on in a faraway land that is not so relevant to what it is you do each day. Um, the roots of what's going on in America began clearly on the African continent, um, but as, as importantly, the lessons to be learned, the insights to be taken are lessons that are as relevant on the African continent as they are on the North American continent. And the more that we can all model certain behaviors um, certain um, vulnerabilities as we as we listen to and bring in our full the full intelligence the full experiences of our employees um, the the greater of a positive impact we can have on development on advancement on the way of life uh, in 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 and across the you know the the, the um, so many countries that, uh, on the African continent so um, with that I'll I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll I'll say thank you and hand it back to you Teresa. Oh, thank you, Gide. Thank you for being here. Thank you for taking your very strong stand. Um, I, I want to make one comment, and then I think we have a question for you. Um, mine is a question slash comment for you. You've been very outspoken on this mm. matter. You've been very direct. You've said that Black Lives Matter. You have a customer base, not all of whom necessarily believe that Black Lives Matter. You have a very diverse group of, of, of customers across the world. Um, but part of your security comes from the fact that you have been on the board of this company for 14 years. You chaired this board for six years before you were named CEO. Can you comment as to how that plays into your ability to take a leadership role on this matter? I, I, I'd say this, Teresa. Actually, the fact that I've been on the board, that I was chairman of the board before I became CEO, so a little bit upside down in terms of the way that went, actually doesn't play in as much because... Um, you know, there, I was thinking about it as you sat and you said that that Standard Bank has a 10 billion market cap, Tapestry has a five billion dollar market cap, right? Um, when I first joined the board of Tapestry, we had a 25 billion dollar market cap, so we've gotten to five the wrong way. Um, and the and 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 part of the reason, that, not part of the reason I am CEO, um, is because I was brought in to turn around this business and to take it to take it back um, and to another to another level. So. But, but you know, as I often say to my you know, to colleagues, um, I fired one CEO. Um, I know how easy that is to do. And so I, I now you know, serve at the you know, at, 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 at basically the, the you know, comfort level, the support level of my board and my stockholders. So I make decisions um, based on what I believe is right. Um, not based on some sense of comfort that because I was on the board or I came from the board, that somehow I'm, I'm, I'm protected. Um, I'm not, and I shouldn't be protected. You know, I should ultimately have to stand on my own two legs in terms of um, commercial performance and as importantly, broader impact, broader performance. So long, long way to say the following. Um, you know, um, first, and it's something that both you and Sim said, um, these are historic times. Let's, let's, be, you know, let's, let's make sure there's no mistake about this. You know, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, people are going to be writing about this moment in time with the with the pandemic, with the you know, global you know, pandemic, with the global economic impact that it's had, you know, that it's had, um, and then now clearly in, in, in the U.S., but 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 also in many other parts of the world, um, the social discontent that is playing that's playing its, its, itself out, uh, and and so if if you can't speak up and speak honestly now about what you what you believe what you're experiencing um, whenever are you going to speak out uh, and and so there's there's a part of it which is this is a moment that I think it, it enables what empowers one um, to be outspoken uh, but I also do believe that uh, if you if you focus on doing the right thing or what you what you um, with your best intention believe is the right thing while it may not be well received in the near term by some people, in the long term, um, I, I really do believe it, it will do it will do well by your corporation and by your colleagues. Um, I, I laughed in just two very brief anecdotes. Um, one was um, after I wrote my letter, I, I sent it to our head of corporate communications and to our to my executive committee, 
and I wasn't quite sure what I was going to get back, right? You, you know, we all sit at home. It's not like the old days, at least here in New York, where you would sit at, around a table and maybe share things. And, and I wasn't sure whether they were going to come back and say, you've lost your mind. You cannot send this to all of our employees. Uh, and I was heartened that um, they came back and said, this is an important message um, and, and we're very supportive of it going out. At the same time, um, I noticed that a number of the suggested line edits were to take out certain things um, that would make it a little bit more comfortable from a corporate perspective. Um, and and, and um, that would include things such as the specific line I put in there, which you know, said black lives matter, right? And, 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 and it was important to me to say that, to, to just acknowledge it very directly. Um, and then also a couple of lines where I called out certain specific geographies of the U.S. as historically not being as 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 strong, um, and I said, no, you know what? I want. I think these are important. I want to put them out there. Um, and so, so it's 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 a dance, and there's no right answer in terms of exactly where you land. But um, I would argue, um, you know, if, if you if you're not pushing your your sense of what is the right thing to do, um, particularly again in moments such as this. Um, you're not likely to have as much of an impact as you as you might hope to have. Um, and then the second thing I'd say, and I was on a call with my executive committee last night where um, somebody took us through some of the reaction that we've seen out there and they walked us through particularly social media and the number of um, the number of, of, of um, subscribers who have who have um, canceled their their you know their their um, you know, their, their um, subscription to whether it's our Instagram page or some of our other pages. And, it, and it's been noticeable in the, last, in the last week since I wrote my letter, you know, we have seen a, a number of people just unsubscribe, boom, gone. Um, and and as, I, as I laughed, I said, you know what, I think we should put a posting up there of a doorknob with the statement, you know, don't let it hit you in the rear end on your way out the door. Um, I don't, you know, in, in the long run, we will be stronger for this, that I'm certain of, particularly just given the broader response that we've gotten back. And I think that as a corporation, we've got to be less um, trying to walk this really fine line, as long as it's very clear that what we're saying and what we're doing um, isn't ideological. Um, it's, it's trying to do the right thing. Very good. Thank you, Judy. We have one question from you. It come uh, for you. It comes from Uzo Iwiala. Uzo is the head of the Africa Center in New York and a best-selling New York Times author and a long list of other accomplishments that I can't uh, put out there. Otherwise, we'd be here all day. Uzo is one of our heroes, one of uh, many of our heroes. So, hello, <laughs> Uzo. Hi, Jide, and thank you, Teresa, for having me on. And Jide, I just want to, first of all, say uh, a, a profound thanks to you for making that bold statement that you made and for setting an example uh, not just for corporate CEOs, but for all of us um, who, are, who are up and coming. As somebody who has been the beneficiary of your wisdom and your mentorship, I, it, it really heartens me to see, to see that, that stance made so plain for everyone. Um, Teresa, you actually took the, the first question like, kind of right out of my mouth, but I do have a second one uh, for you today, which is, um, you know, where you've spoken a lot about the United States, but there have been comments about how some of the, the actions taken against African-Americans or black people in the United States would not be possible if there was a stronger Africa, essentially if African countries were, were, were able to advocate better for global blackness. And I just wanted to get your thoughts and your comments on that and how leaders on the continent, whether they're young or more established in corporate positions um, in government can actually speak more boldly uh, in support of Africans and African Americans here in the United States and around the world. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, a pretty a very profound question. Uh, the core cause of the issues in America are American, right? So they so somebody can't get off the hook by saying, well, if there was more um, outspoken outspoken leadership from Africa, things might be better in America. And I I suspect for the, the example some may use maybe the relationship um, with groups such as APAC in the US um, advocating for the interests of, 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 Jews, in, of Jews in America. Uh, and, and, and while that is, that's great and that's a, you know, that's a powerful relationship, um, I, 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 you know, I, 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 I'm always wary 
about um, taking somehow the heat off of the systemic issues in North America. Um, and at the same time, so not but, uh, you know, I do believe that there is a real role for you know, African leaders, corporate civil society policymakers um, to be very clear about um, some of the core issues here on the continent, um, which as I alluded to in my opening comments, um, in many ways share the same roots and, and not, not completely, but, but there is, there's, there's more overlap there um, than, than, um, you know, than any of us would, would, would hope for. Uh, and, and through that, um, uh, hopefully can have an impact um, on countries on the African continent. And then um, to the extent that, that, there are, um, that there are appropriate venues, but I don't think it has to be um, you know, systematic um, yes, speak out, um, uh, speak out to, to, uh, to, to uh, what they're seeing take place in America. And, and partly the relevance of what happens in America more broadly is just, you know, as a country that fully is, is highly visible, um, what happens in America often does ripple through to the rest of the to, to countries across the globe. And so the, you know, the ability for um, African leaders to um, show their support, to, to express their views is important. The ability also to, you know, I, I'm, I'm as, as Teresa said, I'm, I'm proudly Nigerian American, you know, born on the continent, a son of the continent, you know, who now spends the majority of his time in America. You know, the, the African diaspora, whether in America, whether in Europe, whether in Asia, um, is extraordinary, is extraordinary. And so the ability both for leaders on the continent and then through their friends um, and through their platform um, to have an impact more broadly is, 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 is important and is really important. So long way to say, um, I, I agree with the sentiment, but I'd be really careful about in any way suggesting that the focus should come off of the core causes of the discontent in America. Jide, thank you. I know that um, our time with you is up, but we want to thank you very much for starting our session today, taking the time from what I know is a very busy schedule and a lot of media demands of you in addition to running the company at this moment. Um, your leadership matters. It matters in the United States. It matters on the continent. It matters to the leaders who've joined us today. We thank you for your inspiration. Thank, thank you, Teresa. Thank you, everybody. And, and Teresa, your leadership clearly matters immensely. Um, broadly, um, and, and, and here in particular today, and, and you know, throughout this series of conversations that you're convening. So thank you for what you're doing. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. We are now going to move to the second part of our session. This time, I'm going to turn it over to our content partner for today, Camille, who leads MyPad. And MyPad has been a tremendous platform that Camille has been running since leaving MasterCard and other senior positions in the corporate world. He created MyPad in order to bring the diaspora together and to showcase the tremendous impact and influence that people of African descent have throughout the world. He has MyPad 100 under 40, which is a list published every year of the 40 most influential Black people under the age of 40. We thank you very much, Camille, for helping us to shape this discussion. And I'd like to turn it over to you now so that you can lead the panel of my Padians who um, have joined us to have this important discussion today. Thank you very much, Teresa, for having us on, on this call. Uh, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to be here, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you're dialing in from. Um, I'm happy uh, to, to be here with MyPadians. As Teresa already mentioned, uh, MyPad is an organization that works with the United Nations to recognize the people of African descent all over the world as part of the international decade uh, for people of African descent. And Teresa once said uh, in her TED Talk, that nothing better than success that brings us together. So today, for example, we're here, uh, you know, with our keynote speaker, uh, Jide Zetlin, who's one of four uh, CEOs of Fortune 500 company. When he's successful, success at that level uh, is something we can all attribute and say is, 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 is our own. 
and have I've had the privilege of of doing this for the last three years, uh, recognizing success, black excellence from all over the world. And today we're joined by an amazing panel uh, with a good distribution globally. Uh, we have Diallo Shabazz, who is a co-founder of Birthright Africa, who sits in LA. So he's up very early. So thank you, uh, Diallo, for being here. I appreciate you for that. Uh, also on the panel today, we have uh, a leading uh, businesswoman here on the continent, Tara uh, Durotoye, who's also joining us from Lagos, Nigeria. And also on the panel, uh, we, we have, who's next? Uh, and we have Devala Williams, uh, from Red Media Africa. He's a CEO and the co-founder of Red Media Africa. Thank you, Debola, for joining us also from Lagos. And from East Africa, we have Phyllis, who is the CEO of the Kenya Association of Manufacturers. Uh, thank you very much, Phyllis, for joining us. Another Mike Padian, happy to have you on the call with us. And of course, my very good friend, dear friend, Vusi, uh, from South Africa, and you find that a, a number of the panelists that we do have, they go by their first names, right? So when you say Vusi from South Africa, you know who I'm talking about. And when you say Tar uh, from Nigeria or Debala from Nigeria, you know, you know who we're talking about. And finally, also we have from Uganda, Vanessa Nkati. Thank you, Vanessa, for joining us. So I'll go straight into it, and, and it, it, it's interesting. Uh, the, when you look at the chronological order in which we started the year, uh, the first time we heard about uh, Vanessa and the climate action movement was when was Davos, which was in January. If you all recall, we started the year uh, all on the mantra of the climate action movement. And Vanessa uh, is a young lady who was cropped out of a, of a picture in Davos. Uh, if you all recall when we started uh, this this year, uh, so it's 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 a pleasure to have you here, Vanessa. So we can have a conversation, and just to put it in context for the audience, uh, we're talking about social movements today, and social movements uh, are birthed from social issues, right? Issues that are amplified by by the power of social media, and they lead to social movements where people are seeking for, for, for change. And like I said, uh, you know, we started the year big on climate change. Uh, and what we wanted to discuss during this conversation is how corporations have actually responded to these movements uh, inside Africa, especially business leaders inside Africa. And when we look to find examples, we found a lot of examples outside of Africa. So when you look at what Nike did with Colin Kaepernick, you look at what Amazon, Ben and & Jerry's, and Tapestry, uh, many of them have jumped on the bandwagon of the racial inequality movement that's going on in, in the U.S. right now. So this is the conversation we're going to have today about the power of social movements uh, to, to change societies and how business leaders uh, in Africa uh, will best respond to these uh, social movements. So my first question today is going to go to, to Vanessa, um, talking about the climate change movement. Uh, as I mentioned, Vanessa, uh, Davos, that was when we met. We met right after Davos, uh, when the uh, controversy of you being cropped out from, from the picture. Uh, and as you can see, COVID came and took the wind out of the climate action movement. So the question to you today is, how is the current crisis, which is a COVID crisis, positively or negatively uh, impacted the climate action movement? So over to you, Vanessa. Thanks for joining us. My name is Vanessa Nakate, and yes, I'm a climate activist from Uganda. And um, with the COVID-19 pandemic, of course, a lot is going on with the different lockdowns in the various countries and uh, many activities have been put on hold and that has not um, exempted the climate movement. As a climate activist, the pandemic has uh, caused some 
kind of negativity in a way that some of the activities that we used to do as activists the the climate strikes that we've been doing every every friday while going to the streets and in front of uh, government buildings in front of the parliament but then with the lockdown many of us uh, decided to stay at home simply because as activists we believe uh, in listening to the guidelines of the science we believe in the guidelines that are being given by the who to try and uh, reduce the spread of the virus and if people were told to stay at home we were also included we had to stay at home we had to practice social distancing in order to stop the spread of the virus and we as young people of course we wanted to keep on speaking up and demanding for action but now what had to happen we had to leave the streets and take the climate activism online so we started um, doing climate strikes on Online whereby you make your placard and take photos and share it on social media every Friday and uh, organize quite a number of webinars with different climate activists uh, from from different parts of the world and then uh, doing podcasts interviewing activists so basically as an activist, I have been trying to keep the conversation going even in this period of the COVID-19 pandemic because I clearly understand that many people right now are not so much involved in what is happening when it comes to the planet. They want to hear the information about the pandemic. They want to know the recoveries. They want to know the deaths. They want to know every update about the COVID-19 pandemic. So it's a very hard time to talk about the climate message and yet it is important for us to keep telling people about the importance of conserving our environments and making sure that we secure the future for the coming generations because we've clearly seen that even in the COVID-19 pandemic other people have been experiencing devastating impacts of climate change so people have been battling to um, two challenges at the same time, especially in the African continent. There are families that were already hit by food scarcity as a result of the COVID, sorry, of climate change. And then with the COVID-19 pandemic, they cannot go to work because of the lockdown. So most of them are struggling to find something to eat. I remember reading an article that was um, talking about how the people in Algeria they, they chose to rather go out and uh, die because of the disease than dying because of hunger. So it is an issue that um, people have been handling two problems at the same time. So I personally believe this is the time for climate activists to speak out more. Though of course it is very challenging at such a time when the media coverage is very little when it comes to the climate issues, the climate disasters and reporting about climate uh, climate activists and the work that they are doing. Uh, the focus is so much on the COVID-19 pandemic. And then uh, you find that in the African continent, um, how we've been doing the climate activism i'll speak from from my perspective in uganda it is very hard to organize uh, large strikes or large marches especially if you are not attached to any kind of big organization so we would go to schools and speak to students sometimes and do the strikes within the schools but now that is impossible because the schools have been closed and then when it comes to online activism not every student has a phone, not every student can access the internet. It's kind of different when it comes to the, the students in the, in the African continent. Most of them get to have phones at maybe 18 years or 20 years and uh, this complicates the coordination and running of the climate activism online. So we've had quite a uh, few voices speaking up and uh, demanding for action using their phones and the internet. The, the voices have been limited and then 
the fact that media is so focused on the pandemic, then uh, the, the people, their voices are not being amplified, even the few voices are not being amplified. So that has been uh, challenging to the climate movement. Uh, recently, I saw an article that was talking about um, a, a minister in Canada saying that we should continue with uh, we should continue with the extraction of the of uh, a certain mineral because um, the activists will not protest since they are they are told to practice social distancing. It's it's very disturbing to think that um, in this period when we cannot do the protests on the outside, some of the leaders are using this and taking advantage of the situation to continue with the investments in the fossil fuel industry. Thank you very much, Vanessa, for that. And the message I hear is the fact that the media is not uh, following up on the climate action movement as it was in the beginning of the year, which is understandable. Uh, so I'll move now to talking about the racial inequality movement, Diallo. Uh, just as you heard what Vanessa said in terms of the media, uh, losing momentum with the climate action movement when you look at when we started the year and it moved very quickly to the COVID uh, crisis. Absolutely. Thank you uh, both uh, and thank you for having us. Um, so this is a, a timely conversation and a serious conversation and so good morning, good afternoon and good evening depending on where you are in the world and where you're joining in. Uh, as a co-founder of Birthright Africa, I want to let you know that Birthright Africa is a five-year-old organization that is committed to providing a free educational trip to Africa for every young person of African descent in the United States. Uh, we've sent young people to Ghana, Mali, Togo, and South Africa, uh, and continuing to work with many partners uh, throughout our work. Uh, in addition to talking about uh, the climate action movement and the shift to uh, the current racial equality movement that Camille referenced, uh, there's some additional context that we need. Um, when COVID first appeared, people talked about how it was the 100 year anniversary of the Spanish flu from 1918. But there are some other 100 year anniversaries that we also have to consider because it shows us how we're in a cycle right now dealing with multiple issues at the exact same time. The Spanish flu came out in 1918. In 1919, 1919 in the United States is also known as the Red Summer of 1919. It's when we had one of the largest instances of lynchings, of the killings of black men and women in US history in the, in the summer of 1919. In 1920, we often talk about the civil rights movement in terms of the civil rights acts that were passed in the 1960s. Uh, but the 1920s is really when the civil rights movement started, Marcus Garvey. Uh, it was also the start of the Harlem Renaissance. And so you really have the convergence of, of health and politics and art. And we have the exact same thing happening now in 2020. Social movements have cycles. And it's important that we all, particularly businesses, understand that. Um, Black people comprise only about 2% of corporate board executives in the United States. And at Birthright Africa, we believe that youth and young people of African descent in the diaspora need to feel like they can seek opportunity and thrive outside of a system of racism and oppression. Now, Africa presents that opportunity and Birthright is exposing them to the possibility to explore what the continent has to offer in terms of business and innovation. African leaders and businesses can sponsor Birthright Scholars for this life-changing experiences as one of the ways when they visit African nations and companies so the young people can realize that possibility. And we're already hearing from some of our birthright alumni that have visited Ghana and South Africa, that they can already see themselves living and working on a continent. In the midst of the social and political upheaval happening right now, many black people in the US are having exploratory conversations saying, I'm done with the US, I'm ready to leave. And one of the conversations they're having is where could they possibly go? And the African continent is one of the places that they're looking at. In the United States right now, black people have an annual buying power of over $1.2 trillion. Uh, black people are 20% more likely than the total population to say that they'll pay extra for a product that's consistent with an image that they can identify with or that they want to convey. And so one of the things that African businesses should be looking at now is thinking about how they can directly appeal to black consumers in the United States. They're looking to put their money someplace else. 
Uh, when G-Day was here earlier as what we call in the hip-hop community a true boss as a leader, uh, with his brilliance and courage, uh, there are board members like we hear who can serve at a board capacity that can support African companies on the continent. Uh, we spend half of our lives right now on Zoom anyway. So even though they're in the United States, they can still support and guide African companies there. And obviously, uh, from an investor standpoint, we have people who are looking to invest in companies as well. So now is the point, now is the time for, I think, African business to begin appealing to, in a much more sophisticated way, uh, partnerships with Black people in the U.S. In terms of what others, in terms of other things that the African businesses leaders can, can adopt, uh, there are four things I would throw out. Uh, one of them is to be more sophisticated in terms of your structure. You know, so um, the social development goals. I spent some time in Nairobi, and the social development goals break things down in terms of I mean, economic, environmental, and social lens. You know, we need to be more sophisticated. We're no longer just talking about revenue and social movements from a, from, a, from a financial bottom line. You mentioned social you mentioned social movements, sometimes the businesses, they're like, well, how much money am I gonna make by getting involved in that? You know, the financial bottom line is no longer just the bottom line, it's a triple bottom line. It's environmental, social, and economic. And so we need to be more sophisticated in terms of how we think about uh, appealing to and impacting social movements. Uh, many of the companies that have begun to support social movements recently in the US um, mm -hmm. are doing it through corporate philanthropy or through corporate, corporate social responsibility structures which have been born out of their sophisticated triple bottom line approach. Uh, so we recently heard that Nike, Nike invested, has, has made a commitment to invest $40 million uh, in the coming next four years to support the black community uh, and investing in organizations that are engaged in social justice uh, and education, uh, which is unprecedented for a company to offer that much money. Uh, Moet Hennessy is a French company uh, that has made a commitment to invest directly in the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, and so that's also a transition. Uh, and then the last thing that I'll say is it's important for companies to partner with young people. Uh, we know are, make up the, the largest percentage of young people in the world on the continent of Africa. Movements are led by young people who are in the streets that are redefining the values, uh, our social values, they're inventing new art forms. If you are a business that wants to be innovative, that wants to be at the tipping point of innovation and reaching out to consumers and designing products, and engaging new markets, you have to engage young people. It's one of the things that Birthright Africa is doing by taking young people to the continent of Africa. We're looking forward to working with you as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diallo. I really appreciate that. And it's, it's, it's interesting how, when you look at the chronological order, um, COVID came, took out the uh, climate action movement. Now the racial inequality movement came and it's taken out COVID. It's like COVID never happened, right? The whole focus of the media is now on that. So we can expect that 2020 is a year of crisis. So there's still more to come. So that's why today we're talking about, you know, uh, social movements and what to expect as the year continues. We're only halfway in. So the next social movement we're going to talk about is about gender equality. I've always said that uh, the sexism is the uh, oldest ism, oldest form of discrimination. So uh, I, I have no one better right now to talk to us about, about that than Tara Durotoye, who's a successful leading businesswoman in, in Nigeria. And the question to you, Tara, would be just to share with us your journey in your rise and becoming a leading businesswoman um, and I know you've participated in a number of social movements uh, for women and also for political change. Uh, what have you seen on your journey or head that has left a, an impression of being genuine or impactful or, or, or other? So I'd love for you to just lean into your, your journey and share with us, uh, focusing on the gender equality movement. So over to you, Tara. Hi, everyone. Uh... I founded a company called House of Tara over 20 years ago, and our entire business model has been built around helping women to find financial independence. And in my journey, I realized that women have um, them unlikely to get funding. And, um, and this is one of the reasons why we have inequality around opportunities for women. Uh, I always tell the story of I went into a bank to ask for a loan. And the MD of the bank immediately asked me to ask my husband for collateral. And then I asked him, sir, with all due respect, if my husband came into the bank to ask for a loan, would you ask him to ask me for collateral? And that's an unconscious bias. Um, but he immediately, you know, what, when you say, uh, 
retraced his steps. Uh, but, you know, I had to bring that to his attention. And th these are some of the issues that women are facing across the continent, not being able to find funding for their businesses to grow. We have built an entire business model helping women to find financial independence. The other issue I'd like to raise is around sexual harassment. And um, we've, we've seen a lot of conversations around that in the last year in Nigeria and across the world. But I think that a lot of things that need to, that need to, be, that need to change. Um, I feel that CEOs have to now have to raise their voices um, to, in the same way that Jide has done, send out an email, write a letter um, to the team to let women know that we care and we're concerned about them and too. When we create policies around sexual harassment, many of those policies were created uh, without women in the room to even discuss. Um, many of those um, policies are created just out of, um, wanting to just write and say, oh, this is something we're thinking about, but not something that, so I think that that needs to be redesigned. And the way to redesign it is to ask the women within the organization to say, what do you think we should consider? Uh, we already have a culture of silence, for example, when people don't speak up when there's sexual harassment. We had a very uh, celebrated story, I would say, last year in Nigeria. And we didn't see the response from leadership, leadership across religious bodies, relig um, um, leadership across corporations. Um, we're not seeing that. Um, but I'm very happy, um, just last week, a tech company in Nigeria, the CEO and co-founder of a tech company in Nigeria, was accused of sexual harassment. And I think the progress that we've seen is that the board immediately asked him to step down and, um, and say, you know what, there needs to be investigation. Unfortunately, in the, in the very well celebrated case last year, the pastor was not asked to, to step down. And that's because we haven't gotten to that place yet. And I'm happy to see that we're making progress. Um, I'm, hoping and, and, I'm hoping that the CEOs who are listening will say to themselves, you know, um, these are real issues for women. Women, there's inequality for women. Um, you recognize that, but not to, but to begin to create products that respond to that genuinely. Um, the issue around sexual harassment needs to be addressed. Uh, in, in terms of how the CEOs respond for us as, a, as an organization, we've created lines before where we take out funding from within our business to support organizations who speak and who have centers for people who have been sexually molested or harassed. Organizations like Warif, that's founded by Kemi Ibru or Siseyara are some of the, the examples of organizations that have been created to help. Where we Within the organizations, women are not able to stand, but there's silence, a culture of silence, um, get feedback to say, you know what, my organization is going to be supporting Sisi Yera, for example, or Warwick. That speaks volumes to, to the women in that organization to say, this is not lip service, this is something we're more than willing to do. Uh, and I'm hoping that, that, that this, is my, this is my charge to uh, executives, the entire context of, of the continent. Fantastic. Thank you, Tara, for that. That was brilliant. And it's a very important that we do leave that charge uh, with the uh, business leadership community here in Africa for us to see what's going on in the world and adapt that locally. And in that context, I think it's, 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 it's perfect to bring in uh, another young leader who has been on the forefront on, 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 on changing the continent. And Debola Williams is up next. And the question for him, uh, that I want us to explore is what does he expect to see from corporate leaders across the continent in terms of including Generation X? As you can see, the poll that we took today, majority of the audience today is Generation X, Y, and Z. Uh, what are they doing as business leaders to include them on their boards and in their leadership rank? And something very interesting I want David to for us to also talk about is if a video similar to Amy Cooper in New York, uh, where she weaponized her privilege as a white woman. If a video showed up in Africa today of an executive or an, you know, being tribalistic or you know, sexual harassment, would they be terminated from their work? Uh, similar to what happened with Amy, where her company, a major company, uh, uh, Franklin Templeton actually fired her. So Devola, over to you. Always a pleasure to have you on. So let's talk about that in terms of millennials, generation X, Y, and Z, and what business leaders should do to include them in their leadership rank because they know uh, social media. They know social movements. So when you look at the social movements that are happening around the world, they're being led by young people. So you are one of those phenomenal young people on the continent. So it will be good to hear from you. 
Thank you, Camille. Uh, our company, Red, has spent the last 15 years uh, focused on young people on the continent. Um, our vision is to reach and inspire the largest number of young people on the continent to empower them to make enlightened choices. We build several platforms uh, from television to radio to physical events um, to help young people come into their own. And the idea of doing this over uh, uh, 15 years is to create a pool of credible young people who can take that leadership position and fill those roles from government to top companies, you know, uh, 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 to top MBAs and parastatals amongst others. Um, so indeed, the continent is blessed with young people uh, uh, who are capable of adding value uh, on boards and leadership. Uh, board diversity is key to any organization to thrive. And so having young people on a board, you know, is not even a conversation anymore, uh, particularly because many businesses are having to deal with uh, a, a youth population customer base. And so if your target audience, you know, falls largely within the millennials, you know, like many of the global chains, many of the businesses we see today, then you need to have the wisdom of that generation on your board. Our continent is also the youngest, you know, with a teeming population of young people who are coming out of school into the job market or who are already in the job market. So the workforce for many organizations are young people. For you to be able to help those guys to thrive, for you to be able to, you know, work with them and build systems and structures that can help them be productive for the success of your business, you also need to have their voice on the board. We, for example, in our company, because we've worked with young people for, you know, this long, we have been doing work from home for five years. So before work from home became a cool thing, out of the 22 working days in a month, we do eight work from home. So by the time the world had to shut down into work from home, we were already, you know, there. And that's because our company has been led by young people, a management board of young people, and we pay attention to that, you know, demographic. It's also a very digitally savvy world. It's a tech-driven world. The internet, social media is such a powerful tool today for you to be able to navigate that space. You need to have the voice the sound, the energy of those who understand it. And finally, Camille, for legacy, a new generation means a new way of thinking, means fresh perspective in a fast changing world, it means energy, means vision sharpening, and means legacy transfer. For your business to be relevant today, where we are talking about artificial intelligence, robotics, and creating you know, newer platforms like TikTok, you need to have that generation that understands that space on your board. You know, um, um, and finally, to answer your question on Amy Cooper, um, the internet has created, you know, has empowered the public court. And even when organizations do not want to do the right thing, the internet forces their hand to do the right thing. So the example Tara gave earlier was also forced because there was an outcry on social media. We have seen people lose jobs in 48 hours. In the last three months, I have seen two people who I know personally lose their jobs because of the social media outcry, justified or not. But the point is, it showed the power of the public court. And when you then also live in a country with, I mean, in a world where the public court is so powerful, it means that they also need, you know, people who understand that space on your board so that it can help you preempt, prevent, and manage, you know, or you can simply hire my company who has all the experience to help you, you know, navigate and thrive. <laughs> so, Deva, thank you so much for that. That was brilliant. So, we look forward to seeing more work from Red Media in supporting uh, African business leaders respond effectively to uh, pressures that come from social media and, and social movements that result uh, from, from that. So one, one thing, David, I would love to talk to you about uh, during the question and answer session, just to explore further, is how our culture in Africa also, uh, uh, you know, impacts the results we get from social media. So if you know what has happened in the past where a crisis got online, 
uh, uh, issue got online. So a lady got raped, uh, it got online. And then we made progress on social media. And then when it was time for us to get results, our culture came in and kind of, re you know, we went back again because we're in a culture where silence is really, you know, the, 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 the way we handle things here. So it will be interesting just to hear from you how we can overcome our culture in an era where social media is amplifying these issues. So thank you very much. All right, so let's move to East Africa and, and, and talk to Phyllis. And Phyllis is the head of uh, both local and uh, global corporations who are part of uh, her association. And I, I understand Phyllis is also uh, managing Global Compact, which is a UN private sector arm of corporations. So Phyllis, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it would be good to hear from East Africa. And just from you know, your experience, I, I wanna hear from you. Uh, we all want to hear from you. Uh, what are the responses from corporates in Africa and around the world that you see that, that have made, you know, have come across as genuine? or impactful in response to uh, social movements uh, that, that we see around the world today. Uh, one that stands out for me actually comes from East Africa where based on COVID, um, students don't have access to data to log online for education and telcos is stepping up to actually do that. So that's an example of how a company has actually responded in a time of crisis and how that has actually helped consumers uh, to further patronize their business. So over to you, the question is about ethics and moral values uh, of consumers that can influence uh, purchases. So what are the examples that you've seen? Uh, and it will be good to hear about local and global examples. So Phyllis? Thank you, thank you very much Camille for uh, the, the, the good question and for all the speakers who have gone before me. Um, I'm from East Africa, the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, that is a body representing the manufacturing sector in Kenya. I also chair the Global Compact Network, the UN Global Compact uh, Local Chapter, uh, which brings together businesses that want to drive a responsible uh, and sustainable business. So I'll speak a little bit about COVID and some of the responses we've seen. I think all of us know that COVID has been very unprecedented and has been evolving quite rapidly and has caused a lot of disruption uh, within uh, the, 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 the world and Africa has not been left behind and with our constrained healthcare systems, the insufficient infrastructure and sometimes the weak economies in some of our countries, uh, this has been a challenge that has required the business and government to come together to address. Uh, we have seen a lot of responses uh, uh, globally and I'll speak more about some of the things we've seen happening in East Africa and locally in Kenya. And one of the examples has been the COVID fund uh, that has been set up in Kenya. Uh, this is a private sector lend fund that is putting together initiatives to support the response uh, towards COVID. I sit on that fund. Uh, we are about um, 11 members of the fund and we are looking at the health response and how we can deal with the issues of welfare and livelihood. But one of the things that we are also looking at is how can leaders uh, go beyond the financial contributions and do the needful in addressing the crisis that is before us. Uh, I'll share five areas uh, that I think are important uh, as, we, as we do this and for companies uh, across Africa and then share examples of initiatives that we've seen. So one of the things is the need for leaders, business leaders to pay special attention to offer protection and support to workers in the informal economy. Um, a lot of the economy, at least in Kenya and in a number of African countries, is informal. And what happens is a lot of people survive on daily incomes and there's need for social safety nets to be put in place to support such workers. Uh, so this in includes things like ensuring that they have basic health care, they have their hygiene uh, items and products that they require during this crisis, um, and any PPEs and, uh, uh, and any items that will assist them to navigate the crisis. Uh, the other thing would be to see how we capitalize on the skills of the informal sector. And we've seen that happening in Kenya, for example, where we've seen a lot of the informal sector players uh, capitalize and repurpose their businesses towards meeting some of the market needs and uh, corporate supporting uh, the purchase of those items from the informal sector. Uh, the second response I think that we expect to see from business leaders is to recognize and address the many challenges that women, 
are going to be affected by, by this crisis because obviously they're disproportionately impacted by the crisis. So this includes providing healthcare and hygiene support uh, and uh, ensuring that women as breadwinners and caregivers are supported. Uh, creation of funds, for example, would be one of the ways to do it and supporting women-owned businesses and entrepreneurs uh, to ensure that they are able to uh, sustain their businesses through this crisis. Uh, dealing also with uh, certain specific issues that uh, are able to support them, like provision of diapers and formula and other items that are required uh, within uh, their homes. The other thing is recognizing that human rights is at the heart of any successful business response that we will have to undertake, and that businesses everywhere, regardless of the country or the size, have the responsibility to support the workers and communities that rely on them. And uh, the human rights-based approach requires uh, that businesses recognize the specific and unique needs of the vulnerable groups we've talked about, and uh, that these needs are addressed. Then the fourth thing is about collaboration and communicating openly with communities and stakeholders uh, during this crisis. And lastly, ensuring transparency and accountability in the management of any resources uh, that are being put uh, towards this crisis by businesses. Um, so how do the current crisis uh, and, and, and what are some of the big challenges that it has created and how have we responded to them as businesses? Um, as, as we know, COVID-19 is a health problem, but it also has human, economic, and social issues uh, that have come up. And what is happening is that the most vulnerable in society are most affected. Uh, these are the poor people, the homeless people, refugees, migrants, and, and, and other vulnerable people in society. So to mitigate the impacts of the virus, there is need to put in place comprehensive universal social protection systems that will support the vulnerable people during this crisis. So I'm going to share a little bit of examples of some of the things that we have seen uh, in East Africa uh, towards dealing with the crisis. I'll start with the Association of Manufacturers. One of the things we've been able to do as a business membership organization is ensure that our members remain ethical in pricing. As you can imagine, there are a number of essential products like hygiene products required during this season. And we have ensured that we communicate to our members the need to ensure that they do not unfairly or disproportionately increase prices during the COVID crisis. And we got feedback from our competition authority yesterday that they've been monitoring pricing and pricing has actually remained the same and in some cases gone down for some of these key products. Uh, we've also seen manufacturers repurposing their uh, manufacturing to produce uh, some of these critical products like hand sanitizers, masks, protective footwear and gear, uh, protective uh, scrubs and other items. The automotive sector and Kenya Association of Manufacturers has also uh, been very innovative and ventilator developed locally. Uh, and, and this ventilator has been presented even to our Bureau of Standards. We've had about three different players also within the automotive sector do the same. Uh, the businesses have also been supporting communities by providing soap, hand washing kits, water storage tanks, and other products that have been critical uh, during this crisis. We have offices around the country and uh, a number of our members have been very key and at the forefront of providing some of these items. Then through the COVID fund, we've also seen uh, businesses support and have contributed uh, considerably uh, organizations like Airtel Kenya, which is a mobile service provider providing free internet, Longhorn Publishers, which is a publishing company, also enabling students to continue learning, and our mobile service providers waiving transaction charges uh, during this season. So those are some examples, and as responsible businesses, we want to continue to lead the way and uh, support communities as we go through this crisis. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Phyllis. So good to hear from you and to see the work that you're doing in East Africa. And I think it's very important to continue to share these best practices with each other uh, as we continue to work together, especially as a, a, a MyPad community, but also as a, as a global African family. So I'm going to give my final question to someone I admire very much. And uh, he needs no introduction. I, I say Vusi and everybody know who, who I'm talking about. And the one thing I'm, I want Vusi and I to kind of agree, my experience of him, he always has the ability to, to help quiet all the noise and just help us make sense of it all. 
Uh, so Vusi, um, thank you so much for, for jumping on this call with us and being here you know, with us. So no pressure, but I'm gonna ask you to just do what you do best. Just help us you know, put all of this into context and, and what else can we expect as you know, these crises continue to come and it's just like a snowball effect. Uh, what's going on in, in, in 2020. So without further ado, um, Vusi. Thank you, Camille. I really appreciate you having had me on this. Um, for the fellow MyPadians on this conversation, I'm a MyPad class of 2018, which is the best class of MyPads, <laughs> let me reflect. Um, but I also did want to say to the team at Africa.com um, that they do phenomenal work and we're privileged that they continue to create these kind of platforms where our voices uh, at least to each other we can clarify where there are spaces of grayness tara i'm a huge fan of where you work i've been following your brand forever um and i just wanted to let you know that it may it may be quiet but you are appreciated i think on the question that you've asked here um um camille one of the things we can't do as business people is to imagine that what's happening is happening for the first time and there is this um, you know, terrible habit by society to think that when these things happen, they're happening for the first time. It's not the case. Communities are constantly in a battle for space. And that's where we are. There was a time in the 80s when the battle for space came from uh, you know, the gay and, and, and the queer community. In the 60s, it came from different communities, particularly the Asian communities in the US. In South Africa, we've had our own story, first of colonization, then of apartheid. So there's a consistent and a constant struggle that communities will always have for space. That's good because what people are saying is that they want to live in an environment where the community, both business and social, reflects them. And that's an important place to be. One of the things I find interesting is when business leaders imagine that they can sit on the sidelines of these things, almost as if they can sit on the curb of the freeway of social movement, watch it happen, and then join the conversation at the instance at which it's settled. That's never the case and can never be the case. So if you study the history of South Africa and how we managed to overthrow the system of apartheid, a big part of the offensive was forged exactly by uh, the, the business community who made it clear around the world that the system of apartheid and the government of apartheid was illegitimate, was not going to be supported. And so business has to be a part of the solution. It can't sit on the sidelines and wait for the solution to happen. And then I did just want to say this. One of the interesting things for me is to watch which leaders have courage and which leaders have position. And it's interesting to watch how you can have a leader that is courageous, stands up and is clear about their voice, about their tone, and is clear about the position that must be taken. Because let's just be clear about a couple of things here. There can be no argument about what is just. You can't argue what is just. And so when you're an organization remaining, choosing to remain silent, when somebody's life is lost, or choosing to silence your clarity, when a social movement is there around a, a sort for justice, there's no argument about what's just, unless you want to say as an organization that you see nothing wrong with um, the murder of a black person anywhere in the world. And I think, you know, the point about it is that businesses the world over are going to have to find it in themselves to be more courageous at this time. As a firm, as you know, I run a venture firm. We're invested in, in companies all around the continent. You know, we're in Series A and Series B, so that's typically the space that we finance and invest. We're in South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, and in New York. But as a firm, we issued a, a, a blank statement to all of our portfolio companies saying that if you want to make a statement, you don't need to look for our, for our endorsement. We will stand behind you if you want to make a statement, as long as the statement is clear, as long as the statement is just, and as long as a statement, and this for us was what we thought was the most important guiding principle, as long as the statement is one you'll be able to justify to your children and your great-grandchildren. That, that tends to be the single most important way to bring people towards understanding what is just. Yeah, Vusi, the last we spoke, you said something very profound. You said this could not be a coincidence. 
when you look at the yeah. snowball, right? We started the year with yeah. climate action, we moved to COVID, and now the racial uh, inequality movement. Uh, what do you foresee uh, as we go forward? I mean, we're just halfway through 2020, officially declared the year of crisis. Uh, what do you anticipate? <laughs> <laughs> you know that, that that we can expect uh, you know going forward well let me just say without putting a crystal ball i'll give you the framework right and here's the framework Ex oppression needs a system exclusion needs structures that's how it works so if you want to exclude a particular group of people what you do is you institutionalize the exclusion now in the institutionalization of the exclusion often you use what looks like um, completely innocent scientific um, measures. So T Tara goes to ask for a loan and you say, where is your husband? Behind that, you would say, well, where's your husband? Because I imagine you're married and you're therefore in community of property and the bank would need you to have your partner here. But that, that structure of oppression, right, is precisely how it works. So you institutionalize these structures. And then you have a system which embeds the institutionalization. Now the system tends to be a lot more quiet, it tends to be a lot more subtle, but the system is communal and it's social. It's where our children go, it's where we socialize, and it's the people we keep in company. It's the subtle conversations we have in South Africa at the Bri, in the US it's at the barbecue. And we have these systems, it's who we welcome into our universities, it's who we have publishing academic papers. Here's an even more powerful one. It's the media and the stories we tell in the media. It's how we reflect people to themselves. So black people can only be reflected in Hollywood as slaves. Until somebody goes, why can't we have a genre of horror that reflects black people and the movie Us is made? And why is right. the movie Us so important? Because all of a sudden, black people are seeing themselves in the imagination of a horror. Why, why was Tyler Perry important? Because all of a sudden, black people saw their own stories reflected. True too with Spike Lee. And it's very important here to understand how the system of oppression works. It's subtle, but it's very, very deliberate. And because it's subtle, and because it's so deliberate, it's hard to tackle it because when you tackle it, they'll say, no, no, you, you know, you're imagining this. Tara, come on, you, you know, you're being the loud black woman now. You're completely imagining it. Vusi, there's absolutely no problem with young black people in this company. We've got it sorted out. I imagine, I expect, and I support that there is going to be even more people who say these structures don't work for us. They'll be young, they'll be marginalized, they'll be from different communities, and they'll be from all over the world. Watch out, I just want to say very quickly as a final point, watch out for the uprising that's going to come from the East. Watch out for the young people in the East, in Tibet, and in many of those other countries who are going to want to have their voices heard and are going to want to become a part of this new generation. Absolutely. Very well said. Like I said, you, you, you never disappoint when it comes to these conversations. So thank you so much uh, for, for, for bringing, you know, your style um, to the conversation. So it is time for us to open it up and go back to our uh, panelists. All of you, I would love for us to leave today with a charge to business leaders across Africa. Uh, there was a reason why we took the poll in the beginning. Uh, what you find is that Africa, based on culture, right, you find that ageism, um, baby boomers and generation Xers are still the ones in the position of power. So we need to diversify that and start to include a generation as lead in these social movements. So we're going to open up uh, the conversation uh, to the audience who dialed in from all over the world. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, we have Ramad Mohammed. Ramad is the CEO of Triple E Media Productions, and he asks, what economic systems does Africa need to put into place to reduce social tensions? Is it capitalism? Do we need socialism, a mix, something else? We know we need to keep young people busy, but how do we ensure we don't continue to add to disparities as we continue to grow? Turn it over to you. Look, I think, I just, and I'll, again, I'll try to answer the question broadly, broadly, which is, which is to say this. If privilege wasn't real, there would be no need to protect it. So when, when people are offended at a, at a movement that seeks justice, what they're in effect doing is affirming the very point that the people who are seeking justice are making, which is that the privilege endures, right? 
Uh, my expectation, and I, I want to come at this a different angle, but my expectation is this, that as more and more people don't see themselves reflected in the communities they live, don't see themselves reflected in the businesses they buy from, don't see themselves reflected in the media they consume, and don't see themselves reflected in the aspirations that they have, more and more people will begin to question that. And more and more businesses will have to come on the fold of understanding how do you build a business that is inclusive in the new era. Unfortunately, Camille, many of us aren't trained in that. I, you know, I myself can't remember attending an inclusion class at business school. It's just not something that's, a, that's in the literature. So we have the literature about almost everything else, but we don't quite yet have the literature about how do you build an organization that is current to the time, inclusive to the temperament, and, and agile to the movement of the people. So let me bring Tara back into the conversation because she led you know, a uh, political movement, um, and Dibala yourself too, you've supported governments in to get into office across Africa. So this is uh, political um, systems that you believe can lead Africa, you know, into the future. So what are your thoughts around that? I'm, I'm giving this to Tar and, and Dibala if you want to chime in. Um, thank you for that question, even though I told you not to ask me any questions. Ah. <laughs> But you know we have to wake up. We have to wake up as as uh, as the continent and and not sit on the sideline and imagine that anything is going to change if we don't if we don't make that change. And that change is being participating in politics, and it, it includes voting. It includes being a um, a card carrying member of a party, um, and also speaking up when our leaders are not doing what is right for us. I think we're very silent, um, and many times we're silent, or we're, we, we may be vocal on social media, but when it's time to actually take action, we're not moving. So my charge to young people out there is to say, we can't sit on the sideline and think that things are going to change if we do not participate. So we need to participate in politics. We need to become cat carrying members of parties. We need to actually vote. So we saw that happen at the last, in the last election in Nigeria, where a lot of people were talking on social media, but on the day of the election, they actually didn't come out to vote. And that okay. is a shame. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Debella, you want to chime in? Uh, I think Tara said it all. Um, the citizen is no longer a bystander. That's what everyone must realize. It is time for you to put your skin in the game. There are many things, many myths that politicians have built around the process of elections and politics that deter you from getting engaged. So please research. Pay attention and understand, and I'll give you a quick example. Um, one of the states in, I mean, Lagos, you know, Lagos, Nigeria in the last election had about six point something million people registered to vote. Five point something, 5.5 .5 million people collected their PVCs, their voting cards. But by the time the numbers of those who came out to vote were released, it was 1.3 million. So what that meant was that 4.2 million people sat in their homes and did not come out to vote. So many times when people on the continent, both young and old, say, oh, election, you know, they've, they've cheated, they've, you know, it's not for me, it's for them. You are really the problem because you're part of the 4.2 million people who are sitting at home out of an assumption. So get knowledge. Knowledge is the GPS of life's maze. Once you have the knowledge, you can navigate politics. Fantastic. You leave it to Africans and Nigerians to talk about politics. Politics. We'll be here all day. But, you know, a direct answer to that question for me would be to look at a socialism because you find that Africa is a society we don't have social nets uh, for the uh, less privileged or for the bottom of the pyramid. And, and for me, what I believe political systems should be very conscious of is what I, I call inclusiveness. So, uh, in building a perfect union, uh, which is inclusive with the right founding fathers and mothers uh, who are Muslims, uh, who are Christians, right, of all ethnic groups and working together to build a, uh, an inclusive and equitable society. So uh, not capitalism, because I don't see that helping based on our culture, which is too individualistic uh, for Africa. So if that was a direct answer to that question, I would lean more to a socialism. Or you know, <clears throat> and Camille, if I just, if I may, um, this is actually a, a very popular conversation among black people in the US um, about 
economic development in Africa and what type of economy would be <clears throat> the most successful. Um, just a, a few things. One of the things that we talk about um, uh, within my own, our own circles in Birthright Africa is the possibility of uh, African countries developing more regional economic development, uh, working together more to build economies. Also understanding that in the past 100 years, we're talking about you know the beginning of the Spanish flu, et cetera, the 100 year cycles. Capitalism now looks very different than capitalism looked 100 years ago. Different models, uh, there are different financial instruments that didn't exist. It's possible to reinvent socialism or capitalism in a new way that didn't exist before, before. that is designed in a way to specifically benefit African people. Because many of the ways that the system <clears throat> is not only designed but is regulated allows some of the people in power to <clears throat> manipulate the system in ways that benefit their particular country economies and disempower uh, African countries. Uh, and then the, the last thing that I'll say is, um, when we're talking about ac economic models, we should also be talking about currencies as well. Um, you know, there are regional currencies that have been created. You know, we all know about, you know, the Euro. Uh, there is no reason why in the 21st century there should not be a conversation among the African Union about African countries creating their own currency. Um, uh, digital currencies are being created all the time. Uh, they're going to end up disrupting the way the traditional national currencies are managed and exist. Um, so uh, I think it's a good question, and this is obviously something that's going to continue to develop as we move forward. We're talking about Black Lives Matter. We're attaching to this narrative of Black Lives Matter, that Black lives actually have value. That means that Black communities, Black societies, Black, uh, black indig Indigenous knowledge, we, the, all of those things have value in the world. If that is the case, and my argument, similar to yours, Diallo, is that it is, then we need to have a conversation about why many, and I hate to use the word, but I will, Francophone West African countries continues to have their currencies controlled by France and Belgium. By France, yeah. If you can't disconnect the economic reality of Niger from, from the, the social state of the people of Niger to the fact that that country is in, in, in effect run out of Belgium. And that's just wanted to make that point quite broad. Yeah, so, so Vusi, let's do this. That would be the next uh, crisis uh, and, and social movement to, 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 to jump off in Africa, yes? Yeah, come uh, in, to get the come knee in, of, of, oh, hold on, yeah, let, me, let me land this one. To get the knee of colonialism off the necks of African country, and we need to begin that in Francophone Africa. So Vusi, good point for bringing up uh, Francophone Africa. Uh, Dibala, go ahead. Yeah, Teresa, sorry, we know you need to take questions, but just to quickly say that I get tired when people ask what kind of government, what kind of structure will work on our continent. What we need in Africa are leaders that just care about the people. people. Leaders that care about the well-being of Nigerians, of Ghanaians, of Kenyans. Leaders that treat their people like the Emiratis have shown their own people. Like the Chinese have taken the country where we used to look at in Nigeria as the place where you get rejects and inferior products. And today in Nigeria, the Chinese are building our roads for better quality. Nations like Canada that have taken you know, okay. their people out you know, of poverty. And so for me, African leaders and everyone listening as CEOs of companies, it is really to care about our continent, about our people, and that will force us to also stand up, you know, to vote and, and be part of the, the, the process of governance. We have a question here uh, from Mr. Felicia Phillips. I was wondering whether we need to start looking at how uh, Africa itself can connect with the African-Americans um, because at the moment there's a huge movement going on uh, where we are trying to reconnect from a more cultural and social point of view and yet there's a lot that we should be able to do from an economic point of view and so can we use economics uh, as a basis for pulling the two uh, races if I can use that word with African-American and African races back together again um, Africa has money, we have wealth, we have capabilities, and we've shown that we have competence as well, even based on those who are out there in the States. And uh, it might just be a new kind of paradigm to look at the possibility of both um, of Africa taking leadership for the black race. Uh, pardon me to say that sometimes Africa itself has disappointed uh, the black race in the sense that we are not where we should be for various reasons 
and we all debated that. But uh, if Africa can stand up and say, you know what, we are taking responsibility and therefore let the whole black race around the world come together and use Africa as a foundation for moving forward. It's just a question, it's a possibility, a whole change in mindset. It's beyond cultural, it's beyond music. It's now about really putting money where mouth is. Can we invest? Uh, I saw recently uh, in the news about a lot of uh, African Americans now shifting their money into black banks. Uh, why can't yeah. we have very, very strong global black banks, even in America itself? It's going to be a portfolio investment. And if a few African countries put money into America to try and get the banks to be able to fund African Americans, create a basis for us to connect together again. So my question is, can Africa as a global continent do something in taking leadership with the new narrative? Fantastic. Uh, let me embarrass you, uncle, and call you uncle on this call, right? Uncle Fongusha, good, <laughs> good to see you, good to hear from you. So your, your question is spot on. And this for me is so clear about my fight. My, my fight is Africa's role in you know, leading this collective voice of a billion plus people on the continent and over another 800 plus million across the diaspora and us showing up on the global stage speaking with one voice. So you're spot on about that. Um, Africa needs to be louder in this conversation about Black Lives Matters uh, because if Black Lives Matters in the diaspora, it also means it matters here on the continent. So the connection with the two is that racism in America, right? When slavery was banished, they moved inside Africa and said, okay, since we cannot take you from your home and enslave you, right? We will enslave you on, in your own home. So colonialism is also a need that's on the neck of Africa uh, to deliver on its possibilities. So yes, I'm with you on that, on, on that thought process on Africa playing a stronger role uh, my final thought to you would be, for me, I, I feel like it's hypocritical of Africa to ask the diaspora to bring its money, to bring its expertise and competency to help develop Africa. But when they're dying on the plantation, where are we? Where are the African governments? Where are the foreign ministers in Africa? Where is our foreign policy towards our diaspora? So yes, it's a very valid point. So I'm going to throw this back to, to, to the audience. Um, Vanessa, you're still there. Phyllis, uh, Tara. Uh, Diallo, what did you what do you think of the point of the question? Africa Israel. Diallo, you're in New York, you're in LA. What, yeah. what how would you love to see uh, African governments play a role in this Black Life movement, this racial equality movement in America right now? Well, um, I mean that's a that's a great question, and uh, I'm going to call you Uncle Faluso as well, um, it, even though we just met. Uh, there's a quote uh, that, you know, we are not African because we were born in Africa. We are African because Africa is born in us. And I think for hundreds of years, there's been a rebirth of African culture and spirituality in Black people in the U.S., even if they're disconnected intellectually and culturally from what that means. You know, some of the practices uh, that we still incorporate in our churches uh, and uh, in our social lives now never left, even though we've been disconnected for 500 years. And so uh, even though, you know, there are continental and regional and ethnic differences, we still think of ourselves, um, many of us still think of ourselves as part of the same people. Um, I think Ghana, uh, for one, um, led that effort last year during the year of return, you know, when they uh, invited people, uh, black people in the diaspora to come back to Ghana uh, in 2019. My father was in Ghana in around 2007 uh, for the first time, uh, which I think was around when Ghana had celebrated their 50th anniversary of their independence. And he called me from Ghana and told me two fascinating things. He said, um, the, the Ghanaian government, some people in the Ghanaian government and some spiritual leaders in Ghana who were part of the Ashanti people got together and issued a global apology to black people in the diaspora for some of their ancestors collaborating with the Europeans during the transatlantic slave trade and said, I'm sorry that my ancestors helped to, to kidnap and take you to America. And there's a level of atonement that we need to go through as a people to begin to reconnect as a very spiritual principle. And then the second thing he said was, Ghana's gonna begin creating opportunities for black people to repatriate. You know, if you wanna move to Ghana permanently or come and have a home here or a business here part-time, we're gonna create mechanisms for you to do that. 
And so my father got land and built our family's like first compound in Africa. My father called me and said, for the first time since we left hundreds of years ago, now we have a home to go back to. And so I think one of the things that gov African governments can do is begin to reach out and create programs uh, and protocols that allow people to reconnect to the continent strategically. Ghana like did it through that. tourism yesterday. Um, there are business certification programs that will allow you to do business in some of these countries. I think that, you know, if you figure out like some of the tax rates, people are interested in doing that. I think investors are trying to figure out where they can put money in Africa. There's an old conversation, like an old stereotype that investors, if you put money into Africa, it's hard to get your money out. But African economies and businesses have become much more sophisticated and mature in recent years. And that's definitely no longer the case. There's definitely an opportunity for American investors and businessmen and women to invest in African businesses. And so I think that we're at the precipice of doing a lot of that. Uh, and that as African governments uh, create policies and infrastructure that allow those bridges to be developed. There've always been bridges in Africa. It's just that usually the bridges were built, people took resources out and didn't put the resources Absolutely. back in. But now we're at a point where it can be much more collaborative. I wanted to just contribute. Um, I mean, a nice civil society, I would say. Um, unfortunately, the Nigerian government needs to do much more to make Nigeria more attractive. I give an example, in, and that the size of the entrepreneurs in the class, uh, the size of their businesses compared to the other African countries, we were surprised that this uh, institution was being domiciled in, in, in Ghana. And the reason why is simply because Nigeria is just not attractive enough. Uh, Ghana could throw that entire event in, in December, the return, and it was attractive to Americans to come because Ghana is much safer. And until we have um, more um, solutions around poverty, right, more entrepreneurship, government investing in businesses. I mean, speaking of COVID, for example, how many Nigerian businesses have gotten funding from the Nigerian government? We've been paying taxes for years, right? How many of the Nigerian businesses have been getting support? So if we have to think about Preach. government, if the people who are, who are in government here, right, you haven't done enough, right? Um, we haven't been open for three months. Our entire business has been shut down for three months, but we haven't gotten any support from the Nigerian government, even though we are, we are a business that has been paying taxes. And until the Nigerian government fixes Nigeria, makes Nigeria more attractive, even in terms of just safety, safety, right? I can understand why everybody will rush to Ghana because Ghana is cleaner. I know my husband is going to be very upset in hearing this, but that's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Nigeria, we have to fix Nigeria. The fact about uh, bridging the gap between the diaspora and one of the initiatives that we are running is My Roots in Africa, uh, which leads, it connects with the climate action movement. And one of the things we're trying to do is to symbolically help those in the diaspora to begin that reconnection to the continent by planting a tree which in other, uh, in other words, support the climate action movement. So I think I, uh, Diallo's comments just triggered that in my mind, that it's something that we need to uh, get out there for people of African descent from all over the world, sometimes from unexpected places to do come, plant a tree in Africa uh, and simultaneously be a part of the climate action movement. So I just wanted to put that out there that our struggles are connected and the uh, earlier we recognize that, that our unification is what's going to lead to our emancipation, uh, the sooner we, we will get to the promised land. So that's my final thought. And just want to say thank you to all the panelists and to all the guests who joined us. And of course, to the Africa.com team. Thank you very much. God bless you. No, thank you, Camille. And thank you for stepping up to organize this wonderful group of panelists. I, I thank all of you individually and collectively. Um, my pad has done a great, great job.